The human experience is unimaginably diverse, being moulded by infinite variables out of one's control. Some people can live quite extraordinary lives and flourish given their circumstance, sometimes even shaping history and culture. Others find themselves in a tragic reality experiencing pain and suffering before fading out of a short-lived existence, the majority of what our ancestors endured. Chelino Sanchez is an interesting case where both equally apply, and his ambiguous, fascinating life of drama, fame, wealth and murder offer a story that could rival any top Hollywood screenplay. The Mexican corrido is an extremely popular genre of music, mixing narrative and poetry, singing about oppression, the daily life of the culture, and detailing the exploits of important historic figures in the form of a ballad. Corridos could be considered the news for illiterate people, long before telephones and televisions. Corrido heroes were more usually revolutionaries and bandits, people's achievements worth singing about. They were particularly popular during the Mexican revolutions, such as the Pancho Villa saga, who was a general in the Mexican revolution and former governor of Chihuahua. In essence, these corridos were nationalistic. You can almost compare them to Yankee Doodle. Yankee Doodle came to town a riding on a pony. When Johnny comes marching home. But even more so, Davy Crockett. Davy, Davy Crockett. King of the wild but what was once an old-fashioned genre, Jelena changed this into the equivalent of LA's gangster rap, singing about drugs, guns, and cartels. In the words of Abel Orozco, the owner of El Barral nightclub in Southgate, Chelino changed everything. He was born in the Ranchito of Las Flechas and raised in Sinaloa, a village about 20 miles east of Culiacán. He was the youngest of seven brothers and one sister, and only had a few years of schooling, much like the rest of his brothers, who mostly never attended and sought work at a very early age. He was born as Rosalino Sanchez Felix, but he never identified with his given name as he himself thought it sounded too feminine. He would tell people his baptised name was Marcelino, but he always preferred Celino. He had a very thin build and was rather short, but was equipped with a rather handsome angular face that looked slightly out of shape. He possessed the hard, chiselled energy of the Mexican rancho, and seldom smiled in photos. He spoke the slurred Spanish of the Sinaloan coast, and was seen as shy as he didn't speak very much. His legend begins with an incident right after the Pancho Villa saga. It was 1975 when Chelino was about 11. His only sister Juana attended a party where there were a handful of men present, with questionable character. One was at Valiente, a local tough guy named El Chapo Perez. Whilst at the party, Perez and his friends preyed upon Chelino's sister and raped her, sending her home naked and humiliated. Chelino was young, but he would not forget. He waited a few years until he was 15. He had grown up and wanted revenge. Three to four years after the incident, Chelino heard Perez was at a party which was on November the 20th, honouring the anniversary of the Mexican Revolution. There, he saw El Chapo sitting with two of his brothers. Chelino, concealing a gun, simply walked up to Perez and shot him in the head. Most people in the region went to parties armed and El Chapo's brothers were no exception. So there, in the middle of the party, a shootout ensued between Chelino and Perez's brothers. None of the three men were wounded and Chelino ran off. He said he ran out of there and got home, with his face ripped to pieces for having run through all the bushes and trees. Chelino then spent two weeks hiding, out in the hills, then eventually left for the United States, never to live in Mexico again. He escaped to Los Angeles, arriving in the house of an aunt. For a while he worked on farms, but like many Mexican immigrants, he seized the opportunities of urban employment. He settled in Inglewood as that area in Los Angeles started to become a Mexican immigrant suburbia. 
For a while, he struggled to earn a living any way he could and ended up helping his older brother Armando, a coyote, who had an immigrant smuggling business in Tijuana. He only spent a year doing this and he never liked it. Apparently, the immigrants usually tried to skip without paying. In 1984, the business ended abruptly when Armando was shot in his sleep in a Tijuana hotel. Shortly after his brother was murdered, Chelino found himself in trouble after being arrested for various crimes and ended up in prison for eight months. Chael proved to be an important turning point in his life and is considered to be the start of his career. Imprisoned with him was his cousin Ismael Sanchez, who played the guitar. There were other musicians from Sinaloa, but more importantly there were other men from Sinaloa from the same kind of villages as Chelino, most of them doing time for drug smuggling. Quote, in the jail, there were a lot of guys with good stories to tell. They'd all get together, tell stories, while Ismail played guitar. Chelino turned out to have a remarkable talent for making up lyrics from the stories his fellow prisoners relay to him, converting these harsh stories into narrative-driven corridos, trading his compositions in return for money or favours. When Chelino got out, he returned to Los Angeles. There, he washed cars for a time and dabbled in drug dealing. He did a stint as a driver for Rigo Campos, the owner of a restaurant in Bell Gardens who was involved in the drug business. Rigo could very well have his own documentary, as his life is truly fascinating, as during his drug dealing business, gang rivals wanted to send a message and ended up capturing and torturing him, ripping both of his arms off. After being rehabilitated with prosthetic arms and learning to shoot a weapon again, he foolishly returned to Tijuana, where he was murdered. Chelino would later write a corrido about his former boss. Pero no se le notaban porque de todos calibres las armas la disparaban. In 1983, he met Marcielo Vallejo, an immigrant from Mexicali, who worked in the same sewing factory as his aunt. Then the following year, they got married. That same year, Chalino would go on to write a corrido about his brother Armando, and slowly word spread that he would write ballads on commission and found himself in demand among the low-level traffickers and tough guys of Southern and Baja California. Early on, he would not only just accept money for these compositions, but also anything of value, things like gold, watches, and a number of unique pistols, as his fondness for gun shooting became well known. He began singing almost by mistake. With his first batch of corridos composed, he asked a local Norteño band to record them. Once they got into the studio, however, he found himself taking over, Quote, they had no idea how to sing a corrido, so he got angry and said, Give them to me, I'll sing them myself. He got up and sang them the way he thought they should be sung, and that's how they were recorded for all of time. End quote. In Angel Barral's studio on Olympic Avenue, in about four hours, he recorded 15 corridos, including one for his late brother, Armando. Chelino knew nothing of recording a song. He didn't understand that inside the studio you could stop, talk and edit, nor was he concerned about the audio quality. He didn't consider himself a singer, he just wanted to say, I composed a corrido about you, here's your cassette, says Barra. Chelino knew he was not a good singer, but he could write great corrido lyrics and the tapes were not intended for widespread consumption. This might seem short-sighted, not looking at the mass market, but this personal touch is what made him so popular. And so he found his niche. For his first few cassettes, Chelino would record 15 songs, each commissioned by some local valiente. Make one copy for each client, and that was that. No cover, no title. But six months later, he returned with another 15 songs. He started gaining traction after his third recording session where his clients were ordering extra copies for their friends. Barra suggested they go to a cassette factory. Quote, we ordered up the grand quantity of 300 cassettes printed with side A and side B. End quote. Chelino had unintentionally hit a nerve, and it turned out many people wanted their own corrido. It was a gradual process. He had first entered the studio in 1986 or 87, 
and it would be several more years until he began drawing serious crowds, but already people were struck by his unique style. By mid-1989, Hernández and Los Amables del Norte were his regular bandmates. Around that time, he met a man by the name of Pedro Rivera. In the mid-1980s, Rivera started Cinta Sacuario, a label-slash-recording studio in Long Beach. In LA at the time, only large labels served the Mexican community, labels like CBS, EMI Latin, MuseArt, and RCA. Musicians were at the mercy of these labels, Rivera saw a niche in that he could offer these singers a much better deal. He'd buy their recordings. Cintas Aquario was one of the first independent labels on the outskirts of LA's Mexican music industry, which now there are many. Quote, What I did was to give opportunity to those who had no opportunity at all. We began recording new artists. People loved it because there wasn't anything like it. End quote. These small labels found it impossible to compete with the established LA record distribution system. So instead, these labels shifted copies of their recordings at car washes, bakeries, butcher shops, and most importantly, swap meets. For those entering the music industry, these swap meets were essential in avoiding the gatekeepers of the music industry. They got the product directly to the public without any middlemen, without having to rely on advertising, big distributors, credit lines, or especially Mexican radio. This small label was a great fit for Chelino, because as time went on, it became clear that he horrified the established record industry. His voice by industry standards was famously bad. Chelino would say, I don't sing, I bark. His rough and moaning voice was the echo of the immigrants' rural roots. And that was about the last thing that the Mexican music establishment was going to try and capitalize on. Mexican pop at the time tried to distance themselves as much as possible from the gritty, real life of the drug smuggling ranchos and aimed for high level polish and production. A quote by Abel Orozco says, Producers never believed in the corrido. They never believed they could sell it. They didn't believe in poor people, in hearing real musical feeling. End quote. So seeing as Chelino wasn't welcome in the industry, he had to promote himself. By 1989, he had given up his day jobs, had formed RR Records, and was hustling his cassettes full-time. As demand grew, he became more advanced with his branding, adding album titles and covers. Then, he began selling at swap meets. He began selling really well, Barra remembers. We'd order 500 of the latest cassette, then 200 of the previous one, 100 of the one before that. So there were orders of a thousand at a time. He'd ride around in his truck selling his cassettes to anyone who would buy. Chelino's sound gained huge traction in the immigrant Latino community of LA and convinced Orozco to book him for a gig at El Parral. The crowd was so packed by 8pm that they had to close the doors. And from then on, Chelino had many club owners wanting to book him. His performances became so popular, where people would try and break in and smash windows and police were always called. He was becoming famous. And seeing as he had a valiente, tough guy persona, audience members would sometimes challenge him. On January the 20th, he was booked into Los Arcos, a club in Coachella, 20 miles east of Palm Springs, and the venue was incredibly crowded. That night, shortly before midnight, Chelino was taking requests. In the crowd was a man by the name of Eduardo Gallegos, a 33-year-old unemployed mechanic who was high on alcohol and heroin. He jumped up on stage, and just from a few feet away, he fired a 25mm pistol into Chelino's side. Chelino returned fire, and a shootout ensued in the crowded venue. People tried to frantically escape, smashing windows and running to the doors. A bystander wrestled the gun from Gallegos and shot him in the mouth. The crowd began kicking Gallegos. When it was over, seven people were wounded, including Chelino. René Carranza was also hit in the leg and bled to death as his friends drove wildly to the hospital, and this event cemented Chelino's reputation as a valiente. After this incident, his cassettes would sell better than ever, and he finally received radio play. Although the DJ still refused to play his narco corridos, they chose to only play one of his love songs, Nieves de Enero. After this attempt on Chelino's life, he changed and became quite paranoid. He did a couple of things which were really out of character. For one, he sold his gun collection to his friends. He also changed his attitude in business and was looking more for the short-term game than long-term profits. He demanded upfront money instead of royalties. 
Barra called this Cellino's greatest error. He sold Mozart all rights to his songs, with no royalties, for a lump sum of 350,000 pesos, the equivalent of a mere $115,000 at the time. His royalties today would be worth millions. The quantity of money that that man lost was incredible, says Musart's Fernando González. I think he was already thinking he was going to die. His wife Marciela says, The atmosphere in the bars and the cantinas is dangerous, and he knew it. He did what anyone does when you realise you can die at any time. He put his life in order. He never thought his records would sell as well as they did, or would have helped out as much as they would have. He never felt like an artist. He never knew the magnitude of what he would become. Celino started playing live shows again, and he was offered to perform in Culiacan. He had been advised by his friends that he shouldn't go. After the Coachella shooting, he had been receiving death threats. Culiacan was dangerous and was no longer his home, but the promoter offered him the equivalent of $20,000, and seeing as he asked for half in advance, he was obliged to go. Culiacan has a small population of 600,000 people, and 2,000 people flocked to see him perform. It was a smash hit, and the crowd would erupt in applause. Whilst on stage, he was handed a piece of paper, and it's believed to be a death threat, and that he would be murdered if he were to continue performing. Looking nervous, Cellino disregarded the note and continued. After the successful show, he drove away with two of his brothers, a cousin and a girl. They were pulled over at a traffic circle by a group of armed men in Chevrolet Suburbans. People were confused with who the supposed police officers wanted. They took one of his brothers from the car, and Celino tried to plead with the men, offering them money, to which they didn't accept. Celino told them to leave the others alone as he had just met them at the show. The men didn't realise these were Celino's brothers, so let them go. One of the men stated that their boss wanted to see Celino and after some time, Cellino got in one of the cars and drove off, while the other Suburban followed. A few hours later, as dawn broke on May 16, 1992, a couple of campesinos found the body of Cellino Sanchez dumped by an irrigation canal near the highway, north out of town. He was blindfolded, and his wrists had rope marks. He had been shot twice in the back of the head. Just like Tupac Shakur, his death elevated him from a singer to a legend. The reaction in Culiacan was immediate and everyone would blare Cellino from their stereos non-stop. Word spread in LA, and the label Musart, who now owned all of his rights, took quick action in promoting all of his music, creating new albums, reusing his vocal tracks to create banda and mariachi versions of his songs, and faking duets with the dead Texas border idol Cornelio Reina and the female ranchera Mercedes Castro. Within a couple of years, the corrido scene from Culiacán to Los Angeles was saturated with imitators, all singing in his famous raw country tenor and pictured with pistols and rifles. In the months following his death, close to 150 corridos were written and recorded about him. Everyone wanted to dress like him, sing like him, and pronounce words like him. Who killed Chelino Sanchez and why remains a mystery. The Mexican justice system is how it is, and no one expects the case to be solved. Chalino's son, Adan, followed in his father's footsteps and became very popular. On March 20th, 2004, he gave a concert and made history when he became the youngest headliner and first regional Mexican recording artist to sell out the Kodak Theatre in Hollywood. One week after the concert on March 20th, 2004, Adan Sanchez embarked on a promotional road tour through his father's home state of Sinaloa. He was on his way to a concert when the 1990 Lincoln Town car, owned by Chalino, blew a tyre. According to police, the driver lost control and the vehicle rolled into a ditch. Chalino's son sustained severe head injuries and was found dead at the scene, 18 days before his 20th birthday. Thanks to the legend that Chalino has left, Mexican culture and the narco corrido has been incredibly popular in the mainstream and he has provided generations of Mexicans and Latinos a reason to be proud of who they are. Sal Vieira, an apparent Chalino imitator who became famous, was also tragically murdered in 1998. Quote, When I was in junior high and my dad would play the banda music, I'd be like, my friends are gonna hear. Now it's the other way round. I'm turning it up and my parents are turning it down. When I was younger, I was ashamed of Mexican music. Now I know who I am. I'm not afraid of my race. End quote. 
Chelino Sanchez will forever be known as the king of Narco Corrido. 